1 Corinthians 10, 13, and it reads, There hath no temptation, which is a desire or an impulse, there hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful. Can we say that? But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what ye are able, but with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Bless God. Today I want to present the topic to you, God will make a way, and the subtopic, there's another route. In the scripture text, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he is warning them. He is basically saying, our ancestors, the Israelites, this is some things that they got caught up in and some things that they did, and that's why many of them could not enter into the promised land. Don't you get caught up in it as well. Once you're thinking you're doing well, your own might, your own knowledge, your own strength, once you think you're doing well, don't get so caught up that you end up falling. That's the text prior to verse 13. He gives them examples. He talks about the idolatry, putting things before God, uh, praising and worshiping the creation and not the creator. He talks about sexual immorality and he talks about the grumbling and the complaining. You're ungrateful. God's doing all this stuff and you're ungrateful. Don't get caught up in these things as our ancestors did. That's what he's telling them in the scripture text because he's saying all of this is going to happen. It happened to them. It's going to happen to you. But he's saying that there's no temptation, nothing that is going to come over you, overtake you, that you can't bear it. Because God is faithful. That's what he declares first. And then he says he will make a way of escape. He didn't say there is a way. He said he's going to make it. He's going to create it. He's going to form it. We know that we serve a sovereign God, which means he is all powerful. And he declares that he will uphold you. He will sustain you with his righteous right hand. In his sovereignty, he's able to make a way. The word make is to form, to put together, to combine substances, to construct, to create. I can combine some substances, some eggs, some milk, some flour, some sugar, and I can make a cake. And then I can stand back and I can gloat about it. I can say, look, I made that. God can put things together and make it. And then we stand back as his children and say, when there was no way, bless God, he made a way. Amen. Another definition of make is to cause something to exist, to bring it about. When it wasn't there before, to bring it about. I can make myself, even when I'm sick, go to work. And the abundance or the profit that I receive from that is acknowledgement most times from my employer. She's a hard worker because she's here even when she's turning blue, right? So that is making because you're bringing about an end result. That's another definition of make. So if make is a present tense of putting things together, then made, I made it, I made the cake yesterday, is a past tense. Yeah of the word. I find it very interesting that when I was researching the word made, Webster, the dictionary, defined it as someone saying, bless God, that they have the rights or the qualities to do so. If you made it, you had the right, the capability to do it. God is more than qualified to make a way. So when we declare he will make a way, that is our spirit saying he's done it before, he can yes, do it yes, again. Yes. He's made a way before, he will do it again. When we look back over our life and we remember how he came through the last time, you declare again in your spirit, you're building yourself up that he will do it again. 
He came through before, he'll do it again. And the word says that when praises go up, yeah. that blessings come down. The psalmist put it like this, that he inhabits the praise of his people. That he comes and you're worshiping and you're praising and there's an issue and he sits right on down in your situation, bless God. He sits right on down in the middle of it. He's making a way because you blessed him. Because you prove to him that you believe him, not the circumstance. Yes. That you believe him and not the report that is coming. We choose every day to believe. Amen. But Amen. what are you going to believe? You're going to believe the report of the Lord or you're going to believe the report of man? You're going to believe the diagnosis of the doctor? Or you're going to believe the report of the Lord that says, I am healed, that I am filled, that I am free, that I walk in victory. I have all of this. Which are you going to believe? I believe it was Joseph that said, choose you this day. This day. So we have to make up in our mind every day what we will choose because the circumstances aren't going anywhere to recognize who is greater. You know, the songwriter, she says, God is bigger. We need to declare that over everything, that he is bigger. And we declare that by saying he is able. He's qualified to do so. He's qualified. Sometimes you have to pull out God's resume and dust it off and say, look, devil, he did this for me before. When I didn't have anything, he did it before. When I didn't have the right uh, qualifications for the job, he still did it. I still got the job. I'm gonna share this uh, brief testimony. When I first started in the legal arena, almost 17 years ago, I did not have a legal class that I had taken, didn't have a degree, did not have any legal knowledge. Matter of fact, I was coming from banking and entering into the legal arena. I went to the uh, job and uh, had to be interviewed by the attorney himself. This was a sole proprietorship. And so I'm being interviewed by the attorney and his head assistant, come, legal assistant comes in and she wants to interview me now because he was so impressed. So she interviews me and she slides me a test. It's all about legal stuff. At the time, he was a bankruptcy attorney. I had never filed for bankruptcy, knew anyone that had filed for bankruptcy, or studied anything about bankruptcy. I knew what it meant, but that was it. She slides me the test, I take the test. They call me back and they say, are you sure you have never taken a bankruptcy class? Because I was in school at the time. I said, no, I, I've never taken a class. They said, well, your explanations on this test sound like someone who has taken a bankruptcy course or at least some type of legal class. And I said, I have not. God was making a way for me. Because if you put him first, he said that he would give you the desires of your heart. And my desire was to enter into the legal arena. And he satisfied that desire. Bless God. Without a class, without knowledge, the Holy Spirit said that he would reveal all things unto you. And that's exactly what he did for me. Amen. Be encouraged. Pull out God's resume and say, I wasn't qualified for that job. I may not be qualified for this one, but God's going to make a way. If it be his will, if that's Amen. where he wants Amen. me, he will lead Amen. me, guide me, and direct me to where I need to be. Bless God. Amen. How many times has God proven himself to you? The word declares in Malachi, uh, prove me now here in, in this situation. Yes. Try me now and see. Prove me now here in. David says it like this, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And blessed are those who take refuge, not in themselves, not in man, not in their bank account. Because if tomorrow the dollar meant nothing, it wouldn't matter how many zeros were in your bank account. You can put so many commas and zeros, but if the dollar means nothing tomorrow, you can't do a thing with it. He said, oh, taste and see 
that the Lord is good. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Our refuge and our help that all comes from God. Look at someone and de declare he will make a way. Bless God. Make a way. Turn in your Bibles to uh, Luke chapter 9, 50, verses 51 through 56. The Gospel of Luke, and you can remain seated. I'll just read it. Sometimes when God makes a way, he takes us another route. He changes our course because just because we thought it was going to happen a certain way doesn't mean that that was God's plan. So um, verse 51 says, as the time approached for him to be taken to heaven, Jesus resolutely or intently, purposefully set out for Jerusalem and he sent messengers on ahead who went into the, a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. The people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and the disciples went to another village. Samaria, Samaritans. Where have we heard this before? The Samaritan woman. Jesus met her at the well. He satisfied her need, told her all about herself and about this living water and her not thirsting anymore. And then she went and preached the message to everyone else, come see a man. Yes. So this, and they begged him. This is the same town that begged him to stay after her word. And then when he came, they said, well, not only do we believe because of what she said, but now we see for ourselves, we see for ourselves. So this same village that once welcomed him and wanted him to stay, now because I'm passing through, I can't stay. I can't serve your need that you think is important. But they didn't know he was going to the cross to a greater need. Bless God. But because he couldn't serve their immediate need, they just wanted him. No, you can't come. You're not coming from me. I'm not going to benefit from it. So, no, you can't come through Samaria. You have to go another way. And then James and John got upset. And they said, you want me to call down fire? And he rebuked them. That's okay. There's another way. When your James and John rises up in you, you get upset because it's not going your way. Rebuke yourself. Amen. Rebuke yourself before you have to be rebuked. I'd rather rebuke myself than have God rebuke me. So rebuke yourself. And say, Lord, I trust you even though I don't see. You made a way before. You will make a way again. You are more than qualified. I've looked back over my life. I've looked at your resume and how you brought me from this point to this point. How you moved on my behalf. How you opened doors. And I will continue to trust you. This isn't going to be a one-time thing. This isn't going to be an accidental thing or a coincidence that all of a sudden something happened and then I go back and say I trusted God. No, if it requires prayer and fasting, if it requires isolation, whatever it requires, I'm going to trust you that you will make a way again. Even if it takes me through a detour. Because it says in the scripture that Jesus resolutely, that's intently, that's purposefully, he resolutely was set for Jerusalem. So that meant I don't have time for Samaria right now. I've already blessed you in this area. Now it's time for me to go do something that's going to be greater. For you. I'm doing it for you. Don't be mad because I can't come and sit with you. I'm doing something greater for you. Don't be mad. When he changes your direction, he's doing something greater. Something greater. He says, behold, I do a new thing. But we got to trust. We got to look back and say, he's made a way. Have you been detoured? 
Did you know that one of the definitions of detour is to avoid or to bypass something? Sometimes he's saving you. You think I can't go this way? Why does God want me to go the long way around? He's saving you. Because on the journey, you will learn things that you need to have for the time you get to your destination. You can't wait till you get to your destination and say, let me learn everything now. You need to be equipped when you get there so you can take off running. My son plays football. That's everyone knows. And there's things that he's going to learn in practice that he doesn't have time to learn on the field. If he tries to do it in the game, he will get hurt if he doesn't perfect it in practice. Your journey is your practice. Allow God to take you on the journey, even if it means a detour. It doesn't matter when people reject you. When they say you can't come this way anymore. We accepted you before, but now you can't come this way. Just bless God that he is making another way. Bless God. Sometimes the very people who accepted you before will change their mind. We have to be okay with that. We can't get mad and call down fire from heaven, James and John. They picked up the Peter spirit. We can't get mad. We have to just trust that God is still going to make a way. While preparing this uh, message and studying, and I shared this with Pastor, I heard, stop stressing about the route and trust the driver. You see, when I drive myself, I have to look out for everything. And I get a little tense because Austin is heavily populated, overly populated, and we don't have enough roads for all the cars. So people are doing ridiculous things, coming from the far right lane, three to four lanes over to get in the left lane to make a turn. And you're like, you shouldn't have been over here. But you have all these stresses when you're driving yourself. But if you would sit back and let somebody else drive, if you would sit back and just enjoy the ride, stop stressing about the route and trust the driver, then when you get to your destination, you're filled with peace. Because you aren't worried about all so stop stressing about the route. If God detours you, let him detour you. He's able to see what's down the road. You're not. You only see what's in, ahead of you and what you want. But God knows that that thing is going to destroy you. And we don't want anything. As a Christ follower, I don't want anything on my road that is going to keep me from making it to him one day. So if he detours me, then I must accept the detour. We all must accept the detour, but understand that when you accept it, not that he's punishing you, but that he's making a way and that there is another route. Amen. Bless God. Amen. Don't be upset again, but trust that he who has begun a good work Amen. will finish that work until the day of Christ. And know it's not easy. Things happen and they hurt because we are still human, we're still in this body, still in this flesh, we still have all of these emotions. So things happen, we get hurt, we become heartbroken. But if your faith fails in the day of adversity, how small is your faith? We have to trust Him. Even when we don't see the next step, we still have to keep climbing, keep pushing, run relentlessly knowing He's going to make a way. In fact, he gave us the law to show us ourselves. Amen. He didn't give us the law for us to try to say, we can fix all of this. We can do all of this. I'm so good. I'm going to honor my mother and father. I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to kill. I'm not going to. All the things in the law. I can do all of this. That's not why he sent the law. He sent it because he wanted to show you yourself. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, he says it was the law that showed him his sin. 
It showed him his sin. And if we would stop asking, why me? Didn't Paul say in uh, the first scripture that we looked at, 1 Corinthians 10, didn't he say prior to uh, uh, verse 13 that one of the reasons why they got in trouble, the Israelites, was because of the complaining? The why me attitude is your complaining. If we stop asking why me and saying, what is this teaching me? Yes then we would begin to see ourselves as the law is supposed to show us ourselves, where we fall short. God was never asking us to be perfect. He wanted us to recognize that we weren't and that we needed him. Because when you need somebody, your appreciation for them changes when you need them. And that's what he wanted to show us, that he's able to make a way, that he's able to do it. That he's able to sit down and he wanted us to praise him and worship him for it because that's who he is. Not because of what he did, but because it's who he is. And as we praise him and as we worship him, as I said before, he sits right on down in your situation. And you have peace. Even though everything's coming against you, you have peace. Because you have trusted him. You made up in your mind that regardless of how it looks, I know where all my help comes from. So if he said that this is best for me, then it's best for me. Because he knew the end at the beginning. Bless God. We have to stop asking ourselves why me again. And what is this teaching me? Abraham, the father of faith, he wasn't perfect at all. In fact, if we want to just be completely transparent, he was a liar. He lied to uh, King Abimelech about his wife. He called Sarah his sister. And that was a lie. But God knew that Abraham was going to lie. He knew that. But he, didn't, he still called Abraham friend. He didn't hold that against Abraham. He knows that we're going to fall short. But he will still call us friend if we will trust him. The reason Abraham is called the father of faith, and not in quotes, because he was the father of faith. Whatever your blessing, he tells you that this is going to be your blessing. And your, he tells you then to go and sacrifice that blessing. And you go and you're ready to sacrifice that blessing. Please believe that you have faith. That you trust God. Because he knew this is where the promise is going to come from. He said, I'll be a father of many nations. Now he's saying, kill the very thing where my promise is coming from. When you're ready to sacrifice the very thing that he gave you to fulfill the promise, you are walking in faith. And that is why God called him friend. Because he trusted him. There was no limit. Whatever God said, Abraham believed it. We have to have that same mentality. Whatever God says, we believe it. Unwavering. Even when we don't understand. I can't understand sacrificing my child. I can't understand sacrificing my dreams. But God, give us faith. Increase our faith. So that regardless of what you say, we trust and we believe in you. We know that you are making, you are creating a way because you are more than qualified to do so. Bless God. We have to count it all joy and not walk in fear as James and John did or anger because we know that anger is a byproduct of fear. You're really afraid and that's why you're lashing out because you are afraid. So we don't want to walk in anger. We don't want to walk in fear. We want to rebuke those things that try to rise up and say something contrary to what God is doing. And we want to trust that God's perfect love is going to cast out that fear. But the only way it's going to cast out the fear is we got to get close to God. The closer we get to a person, the more we trust them. The closer we get to our God, the more we trust him. But you got to get close to him. He's a perfect gentleman. 
He said, I stand at the door and I knock. And anyone that lets me in, I will come in and I will suck with him. I will commune with him. I will have this dinner with you and I will teach you things. But you got to let me in. We let him in with our prayer and our fasting and our quiet time and our reading of the Bible. That's how we get to know him. But we have to deny ourselves to do those things because we'll fill our day with everything but what then what, what God wants us to do. We'll go about doing everything else from cleaning baseboards, something we hate to do, instead of getting in your words. Spend some time with your father. And as you hear him, you will hear him more and more and more. It's faith to faith, glory to glory. It only increases once you start using it. So I encourage you, as I close, um, just being a Christ follower, it doesn't mean for any of us that we're not going to be affected by the cares of the world. Because even Jesus dealt with betrayal and loneliness and sadness when he was crying out, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? It's loneliness sadness, heartbreak. He dealt with all of that. Being a Christ follower means that our outlook, that our perspective, it doesn't change. Regardless of the circumstance, we say, Lord, though you slay me, just as you said yesterday, yet yeah, I'll trust you. So we have to make sure that we're not just saying, Lord, I believe, I trust. We have to act it out. And the way we show it is when the trial comes, this doesn't change. That our heart remains tender before him, that we don't become disappointed and start saying, God's not for me because he allowed this to happen. It happened because God is for you. Stop asking why me? It's teaching me that God will make a way. He will make a way even if he's taking me another route. He will make a way. So my assignment to you and to myself is for us to go back. Go back six months. And if that's not enough, go back a year. But go back and write down. Because we want to see things. Where most of us, if it's not in front of us, it's out of sight, out of mind. Write down what God has done for you. My niece's birthday is tomorrow. She's the old, oldest grandchild. And she will be, I think, 25 tomorrow. And last night I was sharing with Pastor how when she was born, she couldn't breathe. That the opening for her lung was the size of a pin, uh, the head of a pin. Now, every head of a pin is tiny. I, I can't even measure it, but I'm sure it's like a millimeter. She couldn't breathe. And so she had all these surgeries. They had to fly her at the time she lived in Hawaii. They flew her to California because they had specialists there that could perform these surgeries. And my mother got up every morning and she prayed and she fasted for this baby. Because all she wanted was to see her healed. She wanted these surgeries to go well. She wanted the doctors to be able to navigate efficiently. And a baby that wasn't even expected to live will turn 25 years old tomorrow. He made a way, bless God. We have to go back and look at our resume and say, God, you did it before, you will do it again. We have to continue even today to still lift up that 25-year-old baby and say, Lord, the way I fasted and prayed for her life then, I will fast and pray for her life now. Because you made a way. You kept her. So that's our assignment. There was an old song that said that we ought to count our blessings, name them one by one, count our blessings, see what the Lord has done. We have to do that. Because the devil, he
he comes to the mind. He wants to discourage. When he comes to your mind, he comes to that battleground. Put on that helmet of salvation. Get your mind right. Put on your helmet of salvation and say, you know what, devil? You can't discourage me. Because let me tell you about my God and everything he has done. Let me tell you about how he healed my grandbaby. She's going to be 25 years old tomorrow. Let me tell you about that job he gave me when I didn't have not one single qualification. Let me tell you about my God. That's the assignment. Brag and boast about your God. Because as you declare in your spirit that he has made a way before, you will see that he will make a way. He's capable of making a way in the future. Bless God. Bless God.